Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Virginia farmers are taking advantage of new media to share their lives with listeners. Spring means fresh asparagus, and we have a delicious soup recipe to share. And egg prices more than doubled last winter before starting to trend downward. We'll take a closer look at the egg industry. Home will always be Virginia, between the Blue Ridge and Chesapeake Bay. Home in my heart always. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from a private voiceover studio located right here in Virginia. All sorts of podcasts are popular with different audiences these days, including farmers. Burke Moeller spoke with one of the better known ag podcasters out there, Rob Sharkey, the shark farmer. It all started with the, the podcast, Shark Farmer Podcast. We Rob Sharkey, the shark farmer, discusses how his life changed once his podcast started getting noticed. We started that and it just, it snowballed. It was crazy. And podcasts were new and we hit the timing right and we were talking about things that nobody else was talking about in agriculture. Podcasters and other new media ag stars were featured last February at the Virginia Farm Bureau Young Farmers Conference held at the Berry Hill Estate in Halifax County. 25 years ago, an online blog meant anyone with an internet connection could become a publisher. Today, anyone with a smartphone can be a podcaster. Podcasts have given many people whose voices hadn't been heard a chance to speak and build an audience. That's worked out for Sharkey. He was interviewed recently by Morgan Slavin and Ashley Cooler, hosts of Virginia's Young Farmers podcast. Your ag journey has been a lot of learning from failures. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's something that we talk a lot about with young farmers in this programming. Um, and we hope that they can hear some of those failures and, and maybe even resonate with them a little bit or learn from it too. Um, so do you mind letting us know, like, what is what was one of those failures that you really learned from or one that just really stuck with you? Well, you know, the, the whole main message of the speech that we give around the country generally is the failure that when we tried to get into hogs when we first got married uh it took us to the took me to the verge of bankruptcy mm -hmm. and then how that we we came out of that a uh, lot of mistakes of uh, basically you, you could talk about I should have filed for bankruptcy and just restarted but we did we decided not to you know i make more mistakes than i make good decisions and that's fine. I mean, they don't define you. And if you can just kind of learn from those. And I look back on some of the biggest mistakes I've made in my life. Uh, honestly, it's gotten me to where I am now. In agriculture, podcasts have the ability to reach farmers as they farm. Whether it's riding a combine or working with animals. A podcast host can be like a friend riding along while at work. Not all podcasts are for entertainment. Elijah Griles with the Virginia Farm Bureau hosts the Cattle Pulse podcast. How do we provide economic information as well as marketing outlooks for cattle producers here in Virginia? And Cattle Pulse is really focused on kind of that dual, dual mission of how do we both look at the national economic trends that affect cattle marketing and then relate that back to our local auctions here in Virginia. Podcasts aren't the only non-traditional media that have found an agriculture audience. Robert Harper has produced the Virginia Farm Bureau's Merchandiser Minute video since 2016. In a video message that lasts about 10 minutes each Friday, he gives insight into farm markets and agribusiness trends. It's not just farm operators who listen. Educators from Virginia Tech to public school teachers use the video in class. When the bell closes in Chicago at 2.15, I start to take all that content and pr try to squeeze it down to what, what is going to give someone who's listening to this a snapshot about what happened this week on the Chicago Board of Trade and then what is going to happen next week, some outlook items, and then take those and say, hey, here's, here's the Virginia-centric part of it. 
podcast started to gain popularity in 2004 as sales of Apple's iPod took off, and today there's approximately 5 million podcasts. One skill successful podcasters share is the ability to open their lives to their audience. I got divorced in the past year, and so my farming operation, I mean, I'm starting back over from scratch again, and that is actually what somebody told me the other day, is that those things don't define you. Um, they help shape you into who you are really supposed to be and mm-hmm. you're, you're destined to become. And, you know, I can tell you you're going to be successful just because, you know, you, 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 not all people would admit, you know, work, I'm going through a divorce. Mm-hmm. They would just keep that to themselves because, I don't know, does that make me look bad or whatever? But the fact that you openly talk about it mm-hmm. only shows me that you're, you're going to embrace the, the lessons from that. In addition to the Virginia Young Farmers podcast, the Shark podcast, Cattle Pulse, and the Merchandiser Minute, there are dozens of other farm and rural podcasts and other new media outlets on the internet, all adding their voices to the agriculture community. In Halifax County, Virginia, I'm Burke Muller reporting. (laughs) Farmers have been using broadcasting to stay connected with consumers and their neighbors for decades. One of the first uses for commercial radio was to bring entertainment and important market news to rural America. So-called clear channel AM radio stations like WSM in Nashville and WRVA in Richmond, Virginia, would boost their radio signals once the sun set so they reached several states. Even today, you can still listen to market reports in a few radio stations in farm country. Today's internet podcasts are far more convenient for producers and consumers, but accomplish many of the same goals. I'm Mark Viet. Coming up on In the Garden, we're going to talk about pruning your summer blooming Annabelle hydrangea. Stay with us. We're stronger together, especially at this difficult time. For over 90 years, we've watched our membership grow, and we're honored to be part of such a special community. Thank you to the farmers who provide for us every day. Virginia Farm Bureau is proud to serve our members, their families, and to give back to our local communities. That's the Farm Bureau way. Gardeners often need to act months in advance to get the best out of their plantings. Mark Viette shows us how to trim summer hydrangeas for color and growth in the garden. The Annabelle hydrangea is probably my number one favorite plant that you can grow in your own garden. You know, probably about 20 years ago, this was maybe three to five plants, and slowly over the years, it's spread. Now, this is the summer blooming hydrangea, not the spring blooming, which could be pink or blue. Those you definitely prune differently. The summer blooming hydrangea blooms on new wood. So anytime during the winter months, all the way through maybe April, uh, you can do this uh, November through April, you can prune these. I prefer to prune them a little later because this provides cover for the wildlife like birds. Uh, You know, we have a couple uh, Cooper's hawk, and other predators here, and the birds like to have some protection. Now there are two ways that you can prune this. One way is to prune them only partially to the ground, and if you prune them partially to the ground, you're gonna get smaller heads. I prefer pruning them closer to the ground, and you can get these nice large heads. You can also dry these. Uh, They bloom starting out green, then they turn white, and then they turn a little olive color, a little bit of green, and that's when you can uh, cut them and hang them upside down and dry them. So, just come in, and uh, I'm gonna do the first way. Pruning them hard is probably the best. So, with your shears, and you're gonna come in here, and I prefer to prune them right down to one bud. Just like this. 
So if you look carefully here, there's a bud here, there's a bud here, there's a bud here. Now, if you want them to be a little taller with smaller flowers, you can prune them like that. But I prefer to prune them to a single bud. And this plant blooms for close to two months. And you can even transplant it. So, you know, during the late winter, you can dig portions of this and put them elsewhere in the garden. Now remember, this is a plant that likes full sun. It's gonna really bloom better in the full sun for you. Here is one that I did not prune hard. And you can see it has multiple heads and the heads are much smaller on this. So what I'm gonna do though for this coming year is prune them to one bud. That one bud's gonna to continue to grow and produce a single stem with a large flowering truss that you see here. Anyone can grow this purple thumb Annabelle hydrangea. It just likes, as I mentioned, full sun, doesn't need a lot of water. So make sure you plant Annabelle hydrangea in your own garden. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. Coming up on Heart of the Home, some delicious asparagus soup. Stay with us. Our cow, she walks into the barn and she gets milked. Milk's taken from her and put through a uh, chiller. And that milk's taken from body temperature of a cow, which is about 102 and a half, and dropped to 35 degrees and put straight onto a tractor trailer. And it goes straight to the plant the next day. So most of the milk that's sitting on your store shelves is probably less than 48 hours old. And that's, that's a pretty good testament to how, how efficient we are. Asparagus is often the first vegetable of the year for many home gardeners. Chef Tammy Brawley shows us how to prepare a great asparagus soup in the springtime, in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. We're here today to make you some delicious asparagus soup. Asparagus is in season right now and this is just one other great recipe to use it for. What I like to talk about when we work with asparagus is um, there's a, a preconceived notion about how you should do asparagus. And I typically leave a rubber band on. I will cut the really tough kind of white grayish ends off. Those are what I will put in either in a compost pile or the trash. But what I do not do when it comes to asparagus, which I know a lot of people do, is when you take the stalk, I do not break it where it's tender because I believe if you do that, you actually waste a bit of a flavor there. I actually will go ahead and just cut, simply cut more of the tough end off. I do feel a little bit more here, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And now for this recipe, we have got some boiling water that we're going to do. We're gonna add a little salt to it. When you add salt to a boiling water um, and a green vegetable, it helps keep the vegetable green. And we're going to go ahead and cut our stalks. I can feel the way my knife is going through that it is w very tender and that's great, that's what we want. So we're gonna cut that off. But the first thing I'm gonna do, because based on this recipe, is I'm actually gonna boil the tips first. I like doing that because they are more tender than the rest of the stalk and they don't take as long. So we're gonna take our tips and add it to the boiling water and it's gonna take maybe, for the tips I say about three minutes or so, but for the stalks I actually think it takes about five minutes. All right, these tips feel soft enough to me. I'm now gonna move them over to a little bowl of ice water. It's what we call blanching or par cooking and it, the cold water, the ice water, tends to immediately stop the hot process, the hot cooking. It also helps to keep the vegetable nice and green. Now we're gonna add our stalks that we've already cut. And that's going to boil for about five minutes or so. Stalks do take a bit longer than the tips. Our stalks have boiled for about five minutes. I felt them, they are nice and soft. I'm gonna go ahead and strain them with a spider spatula into some ice water. Let them uh, immediately stop cooking. All right, now I'm gonna drain the water. 
because I need my pot to actually make the soup. All right, so the pot is back on the burner. Our asparagus is, is chilling in the ice water. I've gone ahead and drained the tips, and I'm going to remove a couple for garnish. Garnishes you know, can be pretty important when you are serving your diners. So we're going to leave about three out here. I'm going to come back and put an olive oil in my pot. So I'm going to go ahead and add some chopped onion to that. And move the onion around a little bit. They'll start to get a little translucent in color. I also like to come back with a little bit of kosher salt to add to that, help that break down a little quicker. We're going to be using some lemon zest and lemon um, strips of lemon in addition to some stock. Stock of choice, okay? If you have vegetarian or vegan friends, I would use a vegetarian stock. You can certainly use a chicken stock. It's up to you. So what I'd like to do is take our lemon and I like to use a serrated peeler and just get a couple of strips off. That's going to go into our soup in just a moment. Do a little another stir there. Now I'm going to take a microplane grater and I'm going to grate some zest of the lemon. And that again is going to be more for garnish than anything else. And we're just going to garnish basically one bowl. So I'm going to set that to the side. And I'm going to cut this lemon in half. I'm going to come back now and I'm going to add two cups of stock to our onions. And I'm going to add the asparagus tips and stalks. Stir that around a bit. And we're going to go ahead and add our lemon strips that we have here. Believe it or not, they might not look like much, but they do add a lot of flavor. Just stir those around in the soup. And now that's going to come back to a boil, and we're going to let it simmer for about five minutes or so. This is something I really like to do with lemons particularly because they have a lot of seeds in them sometimes. Not so much the limes, but the lemons. I love to use a small strainer. I'll put it over my measure, and I will use a lemon squeezer, a very well-loved lemon squeezer, I might add. And I'm going to squeeze that right into our measure. Lemon juice is actually added at the end when we puree the soup. All right, so our asparagus tips and stalks have boiled for about five minutes. I can feel that they're nice and tender. Now I'm going to come back and it's time to actually puree it. But first I actually want to remove the lemon strips. The only reason being is that they could still be just a tad firm. Might be a little harder for the blender. Now, I love to talk about this, okay, and that is an, a stick blender. I love using this thing. Um, they make all sorts of brands out there. I'm not going to recommend one over the other. But I've got this here. I'm actually going to turn my heat off. The boiling has stopped, and now I'm going to run my blender through it. And it does take a couple of minutes. But being that we par-cooked the asparagus, it's nice and soft and then we boiled it further with the stock. Even with a stick blender, there's always safety issues. You guys don't want to lean it while you're blending, because you will, it will splatter out. All right, that is done. The great thing about these is that they come apart and the non-motor part can go in the dishwasher. And now I actually want to stir in a little bit of lemon juice. I probably have from that one lemon about two tablespoons. You don't quite need two tablespoons if you decrease the recipe. So I'm only going to do about a tablespoon. My favorite thing about this recipe is that it's better chilled. Just like anything else, you do it the day before, left over in the refrigerator, and the next day it's nice and cold, especially great on a, a warm summer day. So we'll just put some in our bowl here. And then if you remember, we did set aside some tips for garnish. Delicious asparagus soup can be hot or cold. The lemon is going to be fantastic. And then last, I did have my zest here that I wanted to use. Kind of come back, turn my track over, and then just kind of sprinkle that lemon on there. 
And there you have it. I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen and some lemony asparagus soup, delicious hot or chilled. And we hope you'll join us next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Asparagus is an ideal crop for a backyard gardener or farmer who wants to harvest the first vegetables of spring. Asparagus was raised on 190 Virginia farms covering 176 acres in 2017. It's very cold hardy and is often available as early as March or April. The most important tool for an asparagus grower is patience. It can take three years for a new planting to be ready to harvest, although a few asparagus spears can be taken in the second year. The rest of the time, growers just need to make sure that they are not choked out by weeds. Eggs have long been an affordable source of nutrition and protein, until last winter. Ricky Gibson reports why the price of eggs skyrocketed last year and the challenges that egg producers and consumers face. Whether they come from commercial flocks or someone's backyard, eggs are the latest example of how expensive some foods have become in the past 12 months. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, while overall food inflation hit 9.9% .9 in 2022, egg prices jumped more than 32%. A nationwide outbreak of highly contagious avian flu last fall led to the destruction of millions of birds, creating a perfect storm for egg prices. There have been some factors over the past year that have caused wholesale and retail prices to increase uh, based on supply and demand. Uh, you've had higher uh, input costs uh, in the way of feed, labor, uh, and then you've had this uh, high path avian influenza outbreak that has uh, impacted 44 million lane hens across the country. Hobie Vaughn with the Virginia Poultry Federation says commercial egg producers are being squeezed by short supplies and higher expenses for everything, especially the price of feed and diesel fuel needed to ship eggs to market. Virginia only has two commercial egg farms, so most of the eggs in our grocery stores come from out of state. Now the industry has worked hard to get back online and has um, uh, replenished a lot of the flocks that were, were impacted. Uh, and so supply has been ramping back up. In the December timeframe, egg prices were uh, at whole, wholesale and retail level uh, pretty high. Uh, they've mitigated uh, since then. Just like during the recent pandemic, some consumers turned to local farmers for their foods this winter when prices got high. Dewey Haynes and his wife Barbara sell meats and produce from their Fluvanna County farm. They also saw their expenses jump last winter. The tractor doesn't get used a lot, but you know it, it does help me lift some some items around the farm. We have a side by side. Both of those are diesel. You know they the you know the side by side. I have to I use at least every eight days to pull that forward. Just the cost of delivery of feed went up 75 cents um, per bag in one year. I'm only getting 10 to 15 bags, and or 10 to 15 bags of delivery, and, and you know deliveries every two weeks. But all all of that does does add up. You know, one of the other ones that people aren't aware of, and I, I would associate some of it with diesel costs or other fuel costs, is um, just the cost of an egg carton. That you know that simple little cardboard egg carton. It's gone up 20 percent in just a year. Despite higher expenses, Haynes says they didn't raise their egg prices last year, but He's already warned regular customers their pasture-based eggs will probably cost a little more this summer. The 2022 avian flu outbreak hit just as consumers were gearing up for holiday baking and entertaining, causing major shortages. Avian flu is generally spread by wild birds, but it also can be transported on vehicles, tools, clothing, and shoes. And just like large-scale commercial growers, the Haineses take recommended biosecurity steps to protect their flocks. When we go off farm, um, we have a totally separate pair of shoes. We change other clothing items so that we're not bringing something in. One of the things that they talk about is an exclusionary zone, keeping stuff away from the house. 
And again, just cleaning the items that I bring out here. That the buckets get cleaned when you know, be, you know, when they get brought back and get refilled. We need to encourage uh, biosecurity for backyard flocks, in addition to the commercial flocks, to make sure that uh, we that they are uh, fending off avian influenza as, as well. Because in this most recent outbreak, there have been actually more backyard flocks impacted than commercial flocks across the country. Heading into the spring of 2023, consumer demand for eggs continues to be strong despite higher prices. Both commercial and local egg producers are determined to do their best to keep providing their popular products. In 2022, per capita egg consumption in the United States was 277. It's expected to be 286 or thereabouts in 2023, so it's trending upwards. The USDA is predicting overall food prices will rise another 5% or more this year, and egg prices could go even higher as inflation pumps up the price of fuel and feed. So whether you buy them at a grocery store, at a farmer's market, or have a backyard flock, the price of eggs is expected to continue to be expensive for at least the rest of the year. In Fluvanna County, Virginia, I'm Ricky Gibson reporting. We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our beautiful wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. When the National FFA was founded more than 85 years ago, the world was a much simpler place. Our country was a simpler place. It was a time when about a quarter of all Americans were engaged in agriculture. A time when many farms still operated without electricity. Times have changed. And agriculture has changed, offering new opportunities and careers in fields like business, education, production, and research. That means FFA has changed too. FFA makes a positive difference in the lives of students by developing their potential for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agricultural education. We're strengthening American agriculture and providing our members with the skills needed to build healthy local communities, a strong nation, and a sustainable world. We are the next generation of agriculture. It's our turn now. Let's show the world what we can achieve together. We, we are FFA. FFA.